have Matt Kibbe with us. Matt Kibbe is the founder and president for 11 years of Freedom Works. Right now, he is the president and chief community organizer at Free the People, which is a political organization that deals with millennials and sort of introducing the millennial generation to the values of liberty. He's also president of Alternative PAC, which is a super PAC that supports the libertarian presidential candidate, Gary Johnson. Uh, also, Mr. Kibbe is the author of the second New York Times bestseller, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, which is a libertarian manifesto, as he has dubbed it. Uh, among all, Mr. Kibbe will be talking about the current presidential elections, and I believe all of us will enjoy the lecture. Thank you and enjoy. Oh hey, Erica, it's me. Hey, hey, hey. And who just got the screw? Because you have to choose between a corrupt president or a crazy president. Two more crates for one horse cheese, and the other one needs to buzz. Don't take the money. Blame the two parties. You get it wrong. The two big parties gave you zero good choices. There's Hillary, who's like a monopoly player using a get out of jail free card, then a rigged election card, and make Hillary's a political favorite card. And Trump, who's like, if your racist uncle got drunk, and that is That guy should have nuclear bombs. Now, who cares if Americans will vote for anyone else? Because everything wrong with politics is wrong with Hillary, and everything wrong with the KKK is wrong with Trump. Because he was endorsed by the KKK. Excuse me. But you can't vote for the party because your Republicans and that's a vote for Hillary, and for Democrats it's a vote for Trump. So you stick with the candidates you don't like, just stop the one you hate, splitting the nation in two. Well, what do I know about that? Look, if America is Gotham City, then Hillary is the mob and Trump is the Joker. <laughs> but at least you know what you're getting. The Joker just got here, he's creating total. <laughs> Got here, he's creating total. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad ending. We'll blame that for Oh, hey, <laughs> Anyway, you missed, you missed the punchline, but uh, I wanted to show you guys that video. That is a political ad that our super PAC, Alternative PAC, created to recruit disaffected Democrats and disaffected Republicans. Bernie, former Bernie Sanders supporters, Democratic Socialists, and former Ted Cruz supporters, constitutional conservatives, to pledge to match their votes in support of the libertarian candidate for president of the United States. And the reason I showed you that ad is that is the single most watched political ad in the history of the universe. We had over six, 36 million people view that ad and over 150,000 registered voters used the, the tool on the back end of it to match their vote with, with someone from the other party so that they could vote libertarian without being accused of helping uh, the greater of two evils get elected. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that ad some more, but um, with all due respect to Professor Michel, he thinks that voting is the greatest of all evils. Um, I think podiums are the greatest of all evils. Because when you stand behind a podium, you have an air of authority that you really haven't earned, right? And if you were here two years ago when I spoke, I, I went on about 45 minutes raging against the tyranny of the podium as a metaphor for everything that's wrong with learning, and politics and culture today. Because when I, when I grew up as a kid, I was always stuck listening to someone behind a podium telling me what to think, and I had no means of fact-checking them. I had no means of finding an alternative point of view. I was stuck in the audience, like, like you guys are today, just assuming that the professor behind the podium knew more than I did. Um, today, no matter what I say, if I throw out a number, somebody here is going to fact check me in real time. You're gonna Google me, and if I get it wrong, you're probably gonna ask a really pointed question afterwards, challenging me on my facts. And that, that is a metaphor for everything that is going on today, that power is shifting from the podium back to the end user. 
And I think that's true in politics too. And, and Professor Bichelle talked about the power of civil society and communities and culture and how we shouldn't legitimize politics by, by voting and we shouldn't ever expect political leaders to solve our problems for us. And I agree with that a thousand percent. I don't think that politics is going to solve any of our problems. I don't expect leaders who get elected to political office to magically lose their self-interest and become benevolent dictators once they take power because politics corrupts and absolute power always corrupts absolutely. All of that said, the, the vehicle of politics in the United States, and maybe, maybe this is true here as well, is important because in our country there is only one time every four years when most people pay attention to debates over public policy. When people actually ask questions like, what is this libertarian thing and, and how do I find out more about it? When people start debating the proper size and role of government and, and whether or not you can, you can depend on somebody to do that, that only happens in presidential politics. So think of politics as a pop culture event and think about presidential politics in the United States in 2016. Now I'm gonna use a technical political science term. It's a shit show, right? <laughs> it's a total shit show and everyone's trying to figure out what the hell is going on. How did we get Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? And uh, outside earlier, Someone was excited because they thought that I was, uh, apparently they thought I was with the Trump campaign, not quite understanding the, the context of the meaning of the title of my speech. Trump happens. Do you guys, do you guys get this joke? Thank you. I am not a Trump guy. I am not a Hillary guy. I am a uh, recovering political apparatchik. I'm trying to get out of politics even though I was intimately involved in organizing some of the very first Tea Party protests. I was intimately involved in getting guys like Rand Paul and Mike Lee and Ted Cruz and Justin Amash and Thomas Massey. Maybe some of those names you don't recognize, but there is a new breed of Republican in the United States that we would call either classical liberal or libertarian. And that's, that's historically unprecedented in our country. We had one guy that sort of qualified for that for most of my adult life, and his name was Ron Paul. Um, there are now a lot of Ron Pauls in American politics, and I happen to think that that's a very good thing. And maybe or maybe not, it's a good thing because they're, they're sitting senators and congressmen who have a real ability to impact the process. I can say that Justin Amash single-handedly um, stopped some of the more offensive things that the US surveillance state was hoping to impose simply as one guy. And I think that's important, I think that matters. I think anytime you can stop the expansion of big government, you're doing something that's worth fighting for. But more importantly, getting back to the notion of, of politics as a pop cultural event, the reality is politicians have microphones, they have podiums, and they can use them for good or evil, usually for the latter but more and more often that, that minority voice of libertarianism in our country is, is very important. And I would argue that, that there's something happening that's fundamental, that's a paradigm shift, not just in the United States, but I think across the globe. And it has everything to do with the breakdown of the authority that comes with a podium. All of our top-down structures, our political parties, our news organizations, our professors in, at, in, in college campuses, the way we get our information, the way we curate knowledge, all of these things are falling apart. The old top-down institutions that all of us know and expected to tell us what to think no longer matter so much. And I think that that is the ultimate libertarian opportunity because what happens when somebody monopolizes information. You don't have access to alternative points of view. You don't have a way 
of finding out that there is in fact this guy named Ludwig von Mises who had a very important critique of socialist planning and, and argued fundamentally that it was impossible for any single person to ever have so much knowledge and so much access to all of the information represented, even in this room, to redesign things from the top down. And when you try, it is a human catastrophe of unprecedented historical proportions. But when I was a kid, there was no way to find that alternative inf 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 information. Has anyone here ever had a Marxist professor? Anybody? I'm shocked. In every college campus in the United States, there is a Marxist professor who will tell you that if we just try a little bit harder, if we find somebody a little more honest, if we get the corruption out of politics, socialism will work. This time it's going to work. Yes, we killed 100 million people, conservatively speaking. Yes, we starved entire villages in China, in the Soviet Union, in Cambodia. The list is too long for me to go on. But these experiments in socialism are shocking in their brutality and in the body count. But there are professors with spreadsheets and chalkboards who think we should try it just one more time. But now you don't have to take them at their word. You can fact check them. You can curate a different source of information. You can find knowledge and, and histories about actual experiments in socialism that allow you to defend yourself from some really, really, really bad ideas. So how does politics fit in all this? And how on earth did we end up with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? Let's take a step back, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk in the American context, but I think there's a lot of international examples of the exact same thing happening. Um, a long time ago, 10 years ago, there was a Democrat named Howard Dean. And Howard Dean's campaign manager wrote a very important book set with the title of which was uh, Politics Will Not, what is it? The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And what he was talking about was the power of technology and social media and the internet to organize outside of the formal Democratic Party structure. Now Howard Dean uh, famously crashed and burned and was followed by a host of disruptive politicians from all across the political spectrum, Ron Paul being one of them. The Ron Paul Liberty Movement is unprecedented in world history. And when he came onto the scenes in 2008 and 2012, he turned on an entire new generation to ideas like those of Ludwig von Mises and his critique of socialism, like the idea that's, that central banking and fiat currency and our Federal Reserve was actually an insidious way of transferring wealth from rich connected bankers away from people that held dollars in their hand. Those sort of ideas were never mainstream before because nobody knew they existed. After Ron Paul, of course, came Barack Obama. Barack Obama never should have won the 2008 election. He beat the establishment favorite, Hillary Clinton, who had all of the donors and all of the endorsements and the entire apparatus of the most powerful political party in the world at her disposal. And yet he was able to run a different type of campaign. It was more bottom up. It was more grassroots focused. It was very technologically savvy. He raised a lot of small dollar donations from donors through things like PayPal, which had never been used in politics before. And Hillary Clinton, the tired, recycled Democrat who's been standing in line for it seemingly thousands of years now, <laughs> she was still running TV ads in California. And she had no idea what happened to her. And then came the Tea Party in 2010. The Tea Party was something a classic example of what, of what Gandhi used to talk about with social movements. And this, this, this quote is attributed to Gandhi. I'm saying he said it. You can, you can Google fact check me later and tell me that it's not true. And he said, you know, first they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, and then they attack you, and then you win. And certainly the Tea Party movement went through that 
that, that phase all along and up until election day in 2010, all of the experts were telling us that all of these Tea Party candidates, including Rand Paul and Mike Lee and others, couldn't possibly win. There was no way that this thing was gonna happen. Instead, we had the most sweeping turnover in Congress since the 1940s. It was all bottom up. It was all funded through a very decentralized network of small dollar donors. It was all organized and get out the vote was, was done through technology, through Facebook and Twitter, through very easily accessible social medium that simply hadn't existed before. So you had the emergence of new voices in the political process. It was no longer just the Democratic Party deciding who the Democratic candidate was behind closed doors and the Republican Party doing the same thing over there and voters being stuck with this, this all or nothing lesser of two evil choices. So how does that comport with where we are today? I would argue the result of this election is, is an even heightened example of the disintermediation and, and disruption that's happening in politics today. People know more stuff. And as we're learning, it was never the case that all of us with all of our preferences and hopes and dreams and our, where we come from and what we prioritize in our personal lives, there was no way that you were ever gonna fit us into one of two buckets. And young people in particular are, are offended by this idea that you would only have two choices and they wouldn't even be choices that you were, you were participating in to help curate for yourselves because think about the life that all of you live today. Think about how you choose your music. All of you, and I, I'm not gonna call anybody out here, but somebody here has really weird taste in music. <laughs> I know it's true, you go all the way down to the, the far tail of the internet and you find this really weird band that only you could love. <laughs> and everybody in this room has done that in a way that is so powerful. It empowers new bands, it empowers all sorts of new forms of music and experimentation and entrepreneurship, and it allows everybody literally to get whatever it is they want from music. And of course, you guys do the same thing with information. You have multiple news sources from all over the world, and, and you fact-checked one against the other in a way that gives you tremendous power so that the, the local newspaper, the, the state media, whatever it is that used to tell your parents what to think, they just don't matter that much anymore. You do the same thing with knowledge. Your professor tells you one thing, and you can curate an entire catalog of different sources of information, different economic theories, uh, different cultural paradigms with a click of a mouse. The cyber libertarian John Perry Barlow calls that the right to know. You guys have the right to know, and it's not a positive right. No one's gonna do it for you, but you have the ability to go find out almost anything you want through, let's say, Wikipedia. I was at a Cato speech the other night by the founder of Wikipedia, and I didn't know this, maybe you guys did, but Wikipedia was designed specifically based on the theory offered by Frederick Hayek in his most important essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society. And if you've never read any Austrian economics, don't read all of it, but read that. It's maybe, maybe 10 page, pages long. It's probably the, one of the more understandable articles that Hayek's ever written. And in that article, he describes the power of decentralization. He describes the, the disintermediation of knowledge meaning that all of us know something that no one else knows. And all of us have a time and space and a personal knowledge that is unique to us. And through this process of voluntary cooperation and figuring stuff out and failing at succeeding and, and proposing something that no one's ever proposed before, through that process is where all the awesome stuff comes from. It's how things get better. It's how we get richer. It's how better music is formed. It's, it's where better knowledge comes from. It's this constant thing that, that another economist called um, creative destruction. But it's not, it's not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. And 
in that world, something like Wikipedia, empowered by technology, and decentralizing the burden of knowing to all of the Wikipedians that are constantly updating the entries in this online encyclopedia, they've created, through a community, voluntarily, no one gets paid to do this, by the way, the right to know. How many of you guys use, depend on Wikipedia every time you have to write a paper? I used to have to go to this ancient institution. It was made of stones. It was called a library. <laughs> do you know how long it took to find information in a library? And now you guys can bang out a paper and, and, and act like you're really smart in just a couple minutes. That's, that's power. That's power that people have never had before. And it is the, the potential to do things that we could not have conceived of. As people that believe in liberty, that in, that as people that believe in voluntary cooperation, constantly banging our head against the door of the all-powerful state and all of the, the crony capitalists and insiders that collude to, to build this, this, the status quo, which seems unbreakable to us. So in the United States, in the primary, you had a lot of Republicans like Rand Paul, and I worked for Rand Paul, so you need to know that I'm, I'm biased. I think, I think Rand is one of the good guys. But you had a crowded field of, of about 10,000 Republicans running for president. And um, Ted Cruz was running, and Rand Paul was running, and, and some of the, the so-called Tea Party governors, like, like Scott Walker from Wisconsin, uh, Marco Rubio, a lot of, a lot of different politicians with a lot of different point of views, but generally speaking, they were, um, at least on domestic policy, they were talking about smaller government and balanced budgets and, and, and getting government out of our way. And then you had this guy, Donald Trump, who we all dismissed as a joke. Like, like we literally didn't take him seriously early on because he seemed so gaff prone and, and so, so offensive to so many people we couldn't conceive of how someone like that could win. So we, you know, frankly, we, we ignored him. And, and at our peril, we did so. Um, Rand tried to take him on a few times. Other candidates did as well. And it was, it was like a meat grinder. It was not pretty if you watched it happen because Donald Trump just chewed him up and spit him out. And, and everybody watched. It was like a car wreck. We couldn't turn away. And so we kept watching Republican primary politics. But by the way, the same thing's going on on the Democratic side. Hillary Clinton, of course, won the nomination, but you've, got, you've heard of this guy, Bernie Sanders, right? Bernie Sanders is a, what is he, like 75 or something? 75-year-old, um, unrehabilitated socialist. He's got pictures of all his socialist heroes up on his, his wall. He sort of rebranded himself as a Democratic socialist. And if you listen to his speeches, and you sort of suspended your, your bias that, that you knew you didn't like the socialist guy, you would hear a lot of Ron Paul in a Bernie Sanders speech. He's complaining about permanent war. He's complaining about the Federal Reserve. He was the co-sponsor with Ron Paul on legislation to audit the Federal Reserve. Everyone forgets that now. He was complaining about corny capitalism. He was complaining about Wall Street bailouts he was complaining about infringements on civil liberties at a very one inch deep level. <laughs> to me, that sounds almost exactly like a Ron Paul stump speech. Now, there's the other half of the Bernie Sanders speech. He was complaining about free trade. He, used, he, he had traditionally been anti-immigration because he viewed economics as a zero-sum gain. So if you had open immigration, you would reduce the living standards of everyone. You've heard, you've heard people on the left and the right make those arguments. And he was generally, his view generally was that America's best days were behind us and that we needed government to redistribute a shrinking pie. Now in a lot of that stuff, he sounds exactly like Donald Trump, right? This is the basis of Donald Trump's speech. He's anti-trade, he's anti-immigrant, he's convinced that, that that Americans are losers because we don't have someone nearly as smart as him negotiating our business deals for us, right? And that sort of sums up where we are in American politics today.
Bernie Sanders would have beat Hillary Clinton but for unique rules in the Democratic Party, um, something called superdelegates that game the system against an insurgent candidate. It's sort of ironic that our Democratic Party is, is structured in a fundamentally undemocratic way, but that's the way it is, and if, if that wasn't there, we would be looking at a unvarnished 75-year-old socialist running against a guy who I think has, um, how do we say this word in this country? Fascist, right? <laughs> and I, I don't use that word that much because it's so loaded, but socialism is, is, is government ownership of the means of production. Fascism is government control of the means of production. Both of them require someone with a great amount of discretionary authority to make decisions from the top down. Now, fascism has some other historical um, history that, that sort of make it generally viewed as somehow worse than socialism, but of course, socialism and fascism in practice, I think, are, are quite the same thing. Um, they're all top down, and, and Trump's entire appeal, make America great again, is you need a guy like me in charge to make decisions for you. Isn't that exactly what Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are pitching as well? So we ended up with these choices, but you also have a guy like Gary Johnson, who I, who I think is actually on, on I mean, he's, he's getting beat up right now, and I'll, I'll go into that for a second. But you have a libertarian candidate for president who by any standard, no matter what happens on election day, is going to do things that no libertarian in American politics has ever done before. He's, he's very close to getting 5%, which is a very important threshold in American politics. At that point, you qualify as a real political party, and you get matching, you get matching funding for campaigns, and you get easier ballot access. The challenge with being a third party in the United States is that all the rules of the, two, of the two party system are written by the two parties in charge. So you can imagine fundraising and ballot access and all the practical things you need to run a national party when the parties that don't want you to run are writing the rules. And that's been a fundamental challenge for libertarians. And all that said, I was just in Alaska last week and, and Gary Johnson is still pulling 12% of the vote there. Um, nationally, he's been as high as 13, 14%. And in some states in the West, states that are not particularly Republican or Democrat, um, he's gonna break double digits. And I, I think that's historically unprecedented. We got involved and we did that ad not because we thought Gary Johnson could win. It would have been a, it would, it would have been, I would have been shocked. If, if Gary could have won that campaign. I, I, would have, I, was, I figured there might have been like a 1% chance to do that, but I didn't expect it to happen. But in the process of Gary Johnson running, there is now an entire generation of young Americans who Googled the word libertarian. And a lot of them are saying, that sounds, that actually makes some sense. You'd be shocked at how many American voters didn't even know what the word libertarian was. And think about that in the context of our project today. We want people from all walks of life across the globe to understand how freedom works, to understand that there's an alternative to giving more power and money to government to solve our problems for us. And it is very difficult, even to this day, even with Wikipedia, even with Google search, it is very difficult to get access to good information in real time. And part of that is the natural way that we are as people. We have better things to do than care about who our political leaders are. We have better things to do than vote. We have families and jobs and, and passions that, that really matter to us. And, and I would be the last person to argue that you should put aside that stuff to care about American politics. That would be insanely irrational to do that. But what if we lower the cost of knowing? What if we keep making it more easy for people to find out that there's an alternative set of viewpoints? And that's, that's the opportunity before us. Yes, 
American politics is a shit show. You guys may have a few shit shows here as well, right? Maybe just one somewhere. Um, so you could, look, you could look at the world this way and saying everything is just a mess. The bad guys keep winning. The good guys never get a seat at the table. How do we break through all this stuff? That is the old paradigm. That is the power mongers clinging to the old system where they control information and power and money and all of the stuff that they've always used to keep us outside clashing with everything that I'm talking about. We live in this, this wildly libertarian world because of technology. We choose everything. We curate communities. We, we do things that, that no one's ever been able to do before just because we have a phone in our hands. These two systems are clashing. And the old system, the top-down system, the authoritarian system, it's dying. There's no way that they're going to continue to run things the way they have in the past because it's simple math. There's more of us than there are of them. And power is shifting away from top-down structures back to the end user. So what do we do with that? The ad that I showed you until it melted on the screen, the reach on that ad was bigger than most European countries. The marginal cost of getting there wasn't quite zero, but that, that, was a, that was a shoestring budget that we did use to do that. And as you may have noticed, you guys laughed a few times, that script was written by a comedian. It wasn't written by a professor, it wasn't written by a policy wonk. And I think, I think the one thing we should try to do today, and the reason I love Liebeck so much, is you guys care about the culture. And you guys have been arguing for years, I think even before I did, I might have stolen this idea from you, so I'll, I'll give prop, proper attribution. If we can get into the popular culture and make our ideas cool and interesting and understandable to people, and let's use humor, let's use art, let's use uh, graphic novels as Free the People is using, let's use things that connect with real people as opposed to tired, recycled political stump speeches behind a podium. Nobody gives a shit about that stuff which is why they don't pay attention to it. But that video was shared you know, in American politics, and maybe it's true here as well, politics is something that you don't talk about at the dinner table because your uncle's gonna get really pissed off and you're gonna be shocked to discover that Uncle Bob is actually voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> and then Aunt, Aunt Jane is like a Bernie Sanders guy and she's like a hardcore socialist, she's got Birkenstocks on. And, and they start fighting with each other and then the family breaks up and, and nobody ever talks to each other again. <laughs> but a comedy video? This video was shared 750,000 times on Facebook. Think about the multiplier effect. Um, everybody, in, everybody in social media worries about the echo chambers because we start following other libertarians and we're only talking to ourselves and there's a silo of libertarians and there's a silo of conservatives and progressives. Um, that's not true at all because your friends and your friends' friends and your friends' friends' friends, as these things are shared across a social media platform with zillions of people on it, you're talking to people that don't think they have any in common with you, but your friends shared it. And it's okay to do something if it's funny. It wouldn't be that cool if you just shared a Donald Trump speech against free trade because people, people just wouldn't share it because they wouldn't want to offend their friends. So we could use comedy. We could use short videos and images that are very conducive to the way that Facebook and other social media works today. Are you ever gonna get somebody to read human action? You probably shouldn't try if you wanna keep your friends, but maybe, they would, maybe they'd watch a 30 second ad video talking about the failure of economic calculation under socialism as a story. We, we, did, we drank some beer last night and, and one of the series of the videos that I've produced are about American craft beer. Now, one of the upsides of doing 
videos about beers, you get to drink a lot of beer. And that's, that's pretty awesome. Although at some point you have to stop making videos because you don't really make any sense anymore. But in the United States, we have this radical disruption of all these, these microbreweries and nanobreweries and anarcho-capitalist brewer called the New Agorist. We've got all this stuff going on. And last night at a local brewery here, I had the spitting image of a super hoppy American IPA. That's entrepreneurial innovation. That's what happens when people are free. People are allowed to do things that no one's ever done before. I think if we can tell stories like that, as opposed to forcing people to look at a downward sloping demand curve on a chalkboard, we can really turn people on to the potential of, of economic freedom without boring the hell out of them. So you could be really depressed that libertarians, constitutional conservatives, classical liberals, Rand Paul, Gary Johnson, these guys didn't win in the United States this time. But the, I love the trend. And we gotta look upstream from politics. Don't think that political outcomes are a good measure of what's going on in popular culture. Culture drives political outcomes and eventually maybe politics will get it right. But more importantly, if we get our culture right, if we get education right, if we build communities based on these shared values, politics isn't gonna matter that much. Thank you so much. <laughs>